Competitive Yu-Gi-Oh! is in shambles again. Stop me if you've heard that one before. Bye, Farfa. Attention duelists! Attention duelists! Public service announcement, everyone. I, I, I think I might have broke my pinky. And it's oh, been really no. sore for like three days. That's oh, rough. sorry. Uh, Yu-Gi-Oh, yes. Personally, I don't think I've ever had less motivation to play Yu-Gi-Oh. It's so unfortunate. Like... Don't get like I want to play Yu-Gi-Oh. Uh, for those that have no idea who Farfa is, larger YouTube uh, Yu-Gi-Oh tuber, honestly love him. Heard so many positive things about this man. Like Yu-Gi-Oh is in such a state right now, which is unfortunate because I have waited so many years for Yu-Bell to actually be playable. And now that I have Yu-Bell, and I'm like, God, do I actually want to buy Fiend Smiths? Um, yeah, we're going into a very degenerative format, and a lot of people are jumping ship. But yes, it's it's a meme at this point. Yu-Gi-Oh's dying yet again. I mean, we've heard it all before, why I opened up with it. But, like, there there, there are valid reasons right now with, like, Snake, uh, <laughs> Snake Fire, Snake Eyes, um, Bonfire, Fiendsmiths. There, there's a lot going on right now, and a lot of players aren't happy with it, which is rather unfortunate. Don't want to go around Doom posting about Fiendsmith, X, Multarmies, and the state of the game. Personally, I don't think I've ever had less motivation to play Yu-Gi-Oh. I mean, I think that's a that's an incredibly fair take. I don't even think that's a hot take. You have to also understand, I have debated on playing Magic the Gathering at a pro level, at least attempting to do the pro scene, right? I'll play Modern Tron. Are you kidding me? I'll show up to a tournament. I will flip <laughs> Urza Mine, Power Plant, and Tower. If by turn three, I don't have all three, I just scoop go game two. Tell me I can do that on a professional level and potentially make money doing that? Yeah, I'd brave the Magic the Gathering community for that. Or even Pokemon, right? Yu-Gi-Oh, there's not really cash prizes or incentives, and that's a breaking point for a lot of people. Because like, if you want, you want to play a game, that's fun, right? Absolutely. But when everything else is having cash prizes... It is a make or break it for some people, especially when it costs money to go and do things, right? And you have people <laughs> like my dad that go, I'm sorry, you can make money going around playing Pokemon, going around playing Magic the Gathering? Really? Like, explaining him some of the things that I do is really interesting, actually. But, like, it's interesting to see the state of the game. And when people say things like this, yes, we write it off as, oh, Yu-Gi-Oh is always having an issue, right? I think right now we're, it's a combination of several factors. One, format. Two, cost. Um, three, having such degenerate dust be also cost prohibitive. So it's leading into a very interesting format. When the reigning European champion isn't interested in the game, right. you know things might be especially bad right now. There's been a ridiculous amount of drama this week. Let's break this down. Beat now! To beat. say that Yu-Gi-Oh players are whiny little entitled babies would be an insult to babies. However, something yeah. is feeling a little bit different this time around. So, welcome back to another discussion video. Subscribe for more content like this. You know, the feedback has generally been quite positive for the breakdowns and discussions one-on-ones like this. So hit that bell notification and maybe Patreon as well if you're uh, really enjoying the content. Let's break. Would have liked if this was at the end of the video from a critique standpoint, right? Dude is super legit. I love this. I love that he also just talks. He asks, right? And I love that his feedback has been super positive. I have heard nothing bad about this man. And he just, he, he's one of the people that I look up in the YouTube community. I'm like, wow, you have opinions. You have things. You're awesome. Down the past week's drama in complete depth. Number mm -hmm. one, ban list. New ban list drop, baby. Wait, Block Dragon is finally, oh, sorry. Um, No. Reading what? the script for the next ban list. <laughs> we had a ban list announcement. Kind Did of. We? Number two, let's talk about the format and why people are upset going into this massive WCQ season. Number okay. three, we'll talk about how expensive Price. the upcoming format is starting to shape up to be. Number four, there's been a new Max C card that's been upsetting everyone. Yeah. And finally, number five, let's talk a little bit about quarter century Bazinga and Speed Duel shutting down. And of course, okay. we'll round off with some general personal thoughts, conclusions, etc. Let's proceed. Wait, like the official speed duel format, the thing that they're releasing effectively LCG sets for, you mean I can buy three, three dual, uh, dual Academy boxes and have a complete set like that. That's done already. Come on. What is the this next forbidden and limited list update will be coming in late August. Okay. So we can see the impact of the infinite forbidden on the game before making any changes. We're excited uh -huh. to see everyone's deck building creativity on display once info is released. Yeah, so there is no ban list specifically for the WCQ season next week and the week after for any WCQ and Euros respectively. The Continental Championships will be played under the current format with the new set and most important of all, the World Championship Playoff played on the Friday of each is respective 
of Events Continental Tournament to decide who will be heading on over to the World Championship, the best, highest, craziest, most stringent competitive type of Yu-Gi-Oh ever played outside of the World Championship decided in this current format. This current uh -huh. format that's been so exciting with Snake Eye, but now this Fiendsmith. The positive takeaways here is that, well, Konami communicated. Thank you, Konami. This is genuinely helpful. Please keep doing more stuff like this. While the communication from Konami is sporadic, to say the right. least, there has been improvements slowly, incrementally over time, especially over the last year with regards to communications with the players. Act and that's the thing, like, it's why we praise certain video games and why we disparage others, right? Especially during Lightfall, when Bungie cut off, like, all talks with the player base, right? Like, absolutely, there was a situation in which somebody had sent a, a serious threat to a Bungie developer. I think it was a community manager. Not okay. We all jumped on that player. We all, you know, no, that's not how that works. Be an adult about this, right? Um, and to which led to a, well, we're going to punish all of the players now by not communicating for a period of time, which they, they broke that and they started communicating again. But that's the thing. Like, if I have a game, right, and they're at least communicating, like Helldivers before the whole Sony situation, I was enjoying that transparency. I was enjoying that. And then Sony got involved and I haven't touched Helldivers since. <laughs> but like, yeah, we want companies to at least communicate with us. Tell us what's going on. And there's certain things that they're not going to be able to talk about. They're not going to be able to say, right? Can you imagine if... Uh, they over communicate and say um, they're going to say Maxi is coming back um, after in, in the next ban list, right? Maxi and the TCG will be coming back to three, right? How that's going to potentially like impact product, how it's going to impact uh, the game. Um, we can be making on just speculation. We could be making uh, speculations that end up potentially harming Konami, harming money, uh, harming product, right? Like there's a number of things that you could look at and you can point to and go, okay, yeah. So it makes sense why they can't say everything and why their hands are tied in a lot of capacities. Right. It's, I like that the communication is getting better, but they are still taking some L's like where you can only use official Konami play nats Now. I think that's a huge miss. If somebody's going to bring a, uh, you know, a hentai dark magician girl play mat to an event, they need to change play mats. Okay. If you're going to bring an etchy play mat with big booba, right. Okay, there are kids in the room. Let's let's not do this, okay? I will bring my Jaden and Neospatian mat. I will bring literally anything else, right? Maybe I leave my Project Melody mat at home, right? Maybe I bring my Zentrea Gecko play mat, right? And I think that like it ends up punishing more players when a minority of players end up doing something wrong. Konami had to have an official update to their policy that players must shower, okay? That's a problem. Please, for the love of God, shower before you go to an event. Please. Like, like honestly. <laughs> so it, it, it is another situation where the minority of players are ruining it for the greater player base, which is a problem in my opinion. Actually telling people what the format is going to look like two weeks before the event is sufficient by comparison to what we've had before. Right. It's cutting it tight, but it's something and it's always a net positive when more communication is to be had. Hopefully this is setting a precedent for the future. Well, the negatives here really isn't so much the communication aspect that ties into point number two, which is the format itself. Now, I don't mm -hmm. know if you've paid attention to many of the combos with regards to Fiendsmith and if you started to no. look into and dabble with the new engine that is going to be available in basically every single deck. We're seeing a engine and a deck and one card combos that are on the level of potentially taking on full power tier limit. Because if you're <laughs> able to stand up to tier limit of all decks, then um, you know that this might be a problematic format. The difference I think that's actually a cool way to test that, though. So, and that's actually kind of why I would actually have like full power tier limit or like full power tier, uh, tier Shizu, right? So, think think about it this way, right? We have decks that are banned, right, for reasons, right? Whether you're going to Shockmaster, Rongo Minion, um, number number of cards, any that you can think of, right? If you can have a format legal deck, and say you can stand up to full power Dragon Ruler, full power. Uh, um, Teledad's kind of... I don't know if full-power Teledad would actually per perform in modern in the modern game, actually. But, like, full-power Tier Limit, Tier Shizu, right? Full-power Dragon Ruler, um, Rangu Miniat, Lockout, right? If you can compete with things like that on an effective capacity, you might have a problem. I think we can, like, reasonably agree to that. If you can fight... If, if I was to play Bell right now, right? If I was to play Bell with, you know, Samsara, D-Lotus, combos and stuff like that, and I'm able to stand up to full power ban list, you know, no ban list tier limits, 
I would look at it and go, this is a problem, right? I don't think New Bell has that staying power. I don't think it has that stopping power. But it's something that I think we can all get behind logically and go, yeah, no, that, that's a pretty good benchmark, right? That, that, that would make sense. This year is that a tier mirror match was pretty decent. A snake eye mirror match now. The world champion states Euro's testing <laughs> is going crazy. <laughs> you rolled two nice. dice. Two world championship playoff duelists said the following. People don't realize the new TCG exclusive cards made Fiend Smith snake eye combos even more broken. I have two buys for the EU WCQ and I couldn't care less. Konami, fix your game. Testing for Euros has been the most demoralizing format I've seen in a while. While. Whoever designed Fiend Smith needs a reality check. I genuinely don't want to put efforts in for the playoffs, and I've planned most of my July around testing, but I might just use it to play Lorcana. That's the one. That's the one. Why is Disney Lorcana even a consideration? It blows my mind that people are even considering Lorcana. I haven't played it. I don't have an interest in playing it. There's something about a Disney TCG that just doesn't do it for me, okay? That, but that's the thing. It could be your thing. And they also, from my understanding, offer cash prizes. When you are a long-standing card game, you are one of the big three. Magic the Gathering, Pokemon TCG, and Yu-Gi-Oh! The Trading Card Game. When you are one of the big three, and you're starting to lose your slot to Lorcana? Bro, do I just need to do some streams where I just like, like implement game design where I just actually design a card game and then just sell it? Or do I just, or just work with it? I'll do it at this point. If the bar is going to be that low, I will just design a TCG at this point. <laughs> like, good God. <laughs> like, no game is going to be perfect ever. Magic the Gathering has its own issues, right? Like we have, it, it has its own issues. Well, Ragavan was a thing uh, in the last couple years, right? $200 per so it's like an $800 play set for Monkey. Monkey is banned in what? Legacy, but not banned in... Mo or was it banned in Modern? Magic has its own issues, okay? <laughs> All I'm saying, Pokemon TCG can have its own issues. Everything's going to have a system and everything's going to have a preference. They're all going to have their own issues. Like, I don't know. It, it's so weird to me to like kind of see Konami kind of slip like this. And don't get me wrong, like, I like playing u -Bell. I like being able to go say Sumsar, d Lotus, Tribute, bring out Spirit of u -Bell, stuff like that. Nightmare Throne, one card combo. I think that in u -Bell, it can work, because while you can splash the u -Bell engine, especially Spirit of u -Bell, how how do you design a card? You can design a power card, but limit what can use it, right? This is why we have entire archetypes with a card that's effectively, I don't know, a pot of greed. Or you have cards like Sky Striker, Mobilize, Engage. Yeah, can you imagine if that was just generic? Or can you, or um, like you can have a, like reptiles, you know, discard uh, discard one reptile card, draw two cards, right? You could have your rare value trade and whatever for reptiles, right? But if you had it for warriors, right? Or if you had it for just discard and dragon, like a single dragon, not level eight, because remember, trade level eight, right? Maybe we're starting to run into issues there. Reinforcement of the army, right? I mean, limited one of for good reason. Point in case, sky strikers. <laughs> It's interesting to see where they're going with their design. I still play it. I have Infernoids at the ready. I actually worked on decks this week. Infernoid, Sky Striker, Ubel, Branded, something else, but I can't remember off the top of my head. Like, I play this game. It's in such a state right now. It Instead. always is, be real. And again, a lot of this comes down to one-card combos. When your singular one copy yep. of Dark Beckoning Beast or Snake Eye Ash can end on about four or five disruptions, yeah. then that is a hugely, hugely problematic it's too issue value. for the game. Because it means that now everyone has to clog their entire deck list with multiple hand traps. Because drawing one hand trap, sometimes two hand traps, isn't enough to stop the power of these decks when they have such powerful one-card combos mm -hmm. plus extenders. And for those of you who... Don't we have, isn't Droll and Lockbird seeing play right now? What What is it that somebody said? Was it, was it Tegis Anime, Dual Logs, or DZ, if I can't remember. The more place uh, that Droll and Lockbird sees in a format is intrinsically tied to the degeneracy of the format. So when you start seeing Droll and Lockbird mained, you might have a problem with your format.
I have not been acquainted yet with a single copy of a Fiendsmith engraver or any two monsters. No. That's really the point here, is if you recall, about five or six years ago, we had Nightmare Mermaid, and basically everyone with uh, two monsters on the field were combining into a Nightmare Phoenix or Cerberus, and then going up into a Nightmare Mermaid, discarding a card and performing full Orcus combo. People Rough. got very sick of that very quickly in 2018. So naturally, this is creating a gameplay loop where going first is so unbelievably powerful Powerful that you, again, as mentioned, need to drop two plus hand traps to stand a chance going second. And even with board That's breakers wild. going second, they just have so many tools and resources available to them outside of just on the field with the grave in the hand that things like droplet, dart ruler, evenly matched aren't enough by themselves in That's the same wild. way that you would hope most breakers to work. And with a list coming after these major events in late August, safe to assume Fiendsmith isn't going to be touched one no. bit. No. Snake Eye might bite the dust potentially, but we'll see because it's the world championship in September, meaning that it feels kind of weird for them to immediately kill a deck just before the world championship. Right. So what that means is I wouldn't be surprised if we'll be playing with these cards for yet even longer. Now let's talk about topic number three. Let's say you are interested in playing with these Fiendsmith cards, which admittedly, there is something enjoyable and cathartic about doing insane one card combos or playing through multiple disruptions and hand traps to set up some sort of an adequate field, but yeah. you know, not when you're on the receiving end of it. But it Regardless, you're probably going to be playing this format and this deck if you clicked on this video. And if you are, well, you'll be happy to be introduced that things are looking pretty great for budget players, provided that budget players are willing to rob a bank. <laughs> Yeah. On the plus side, a lot of the extra deck pieces are commons and super. In yeah. fact, uh, very low rarity cards for some of these important comp- Isn't that Despair from the Dark? Isn't this just Despair from the Dark effectively just upgraded, like glowed up? enablers as well as some exclusives which has made Fiendsmith even more powerful somehow uh -huh. if that was even possible but of course <laughs> the three ofs and the very important Fiendsmith and Graver himself is he, he runs into the Deneb effect remember in Duel It's Alliance format why Teller Knight Deneb was like $40 a copy because it was only an ultra rare we actually saw I think it was certain secret rares actually were pretty cheap um rares supers it was the ultra slot that was a problem I remember when Dante launched, he was like $20 and then he jumped up to 80 because I just called him like this guy's going to be value straight up. I was part of a Yu-Gi-Oh! Facebook group at that time. I watched Dante spike to 80 and 100. It was originally 20 and then Burning Abyss became an absolute just absolute time. Dear God, like Fiendsmith Engraver, I'm looking on TCG player like it is. It's kind of just sitting there at like. It's it's the secret slot, right? Like it's. <sighs> It's why the stupid dragon, the the new chase uh, dragon that everyone's trying to do, the blue eyes one, like it's why everybody wants that. Like it's cool, it's shiny, but it's it has its price point because it's only one printing. Fiendsmith Engraver, right now, TCG player, as of recording this video, ninety eight fifty a copy. Jesus Christ! <laughs> do I need it that bad? Do I just want to shit post this entire format and play like I don't know, Dark Fusion Infernal? <laughs> it's like. <laughs> Do I wait for Supreme Darkness? Like, what do I do at this point? <laughs> I think he's definitely on point here. Like, don't don't get me wrong, okay? Don't get me wrong. If you're wanting to get into this game, and we go to, say, Battle Legend uh, Terminal Revenge, right? There are a lot of staples for cheap, okay? Dude, Snatch Steel, 50 cents a copy. Snatch Steel, okay? We got Ice Barrier support. We got Cool Exodia support. Like, we have support. Um, we have things like Oil that came out in the set. Like, still $3, $4. Right? Like, Branded Fusions! Sexy copy, secret rare, 66 cents, right? But if you're wanting to play your Fiendsmiths, good God, you're you're taking out a loan, my guy. Are you are you bringing out that HELOC? You putting your home up, the equity in your home for a loan? Good God, dude. Like, wow. A secret rare. And also, don't forget the fact that every single deck in Yugo can probably jam in the Fiendsmith engine. This is yeah. further inflating the price of this product. Yes. I saw pre sales on a UK retailer for £70. Now on eBay, £95 for a singular copy of Engraver. Awful. About $300 for the set. Cheapest on TCG player was over $100 yes. per pop. And yep. in Europe, it's about the same in Euros. Now, we don't need to obviously over explain why card expensive bad, but when an average teenager's part-time job pay for a week can't even afford a play set of engraver no, kind of prob problematic right i mean who is the game priced for at that point i'm okay with the stupid dragon right so if we go here if we go back to the funny set right and we go to uh terminal revenge i'm trying to remember what its name is it's the stupid magister knight right it is only in one printing 
That is why you're paying that price tag. Trying to find it in the other window. You are paying that price point. And even then, let's, go, let's just go to the page. Right? Just go to um, Terminal Revenge, right? Why are you paying $90 for a Lubellion? Oh, well, it's a quarter century rare. Brand Fusion, quarter century, $83. Phantom B.U. Bell, almost $200 for a quarter century rare. Infernoid Evil, just whatever, you know, quarter century secret rare, 30 bucks. It's Infernoids. Hopefully it gets better. It probably won't. Sky Striker, Alternate. Like, these for collectors, I think is fine. I think if you want alternate arts, I think if you want really shiny cards, um, even then, I, I technically cannot get mad at the funny dragon for being like $500 because I don't need it. A lot of people want it as a collector piece, but like they don't need it. Dragon Master Magic, this is what I'm talking about. The only printing is in the QCR slot, the quarter century rare slot, $520 USD, right? But what happens is you have players buying into this, right? Because they want to pull this, right? They want to pull this. They want to pull their quarter century or a snatch deal, maybe for something like goat format or whatever, right? Like they want to pull this and what does that have the effect? That means more product has been opened. And because more product has been opened and there's more bulk, that means I can get snatch deals for 50 cents. So for budget players like me that look at, oh, Shining Star Dragon used to be like five bucks. Don't really care about buying it. Oh, I'll just I'll buy it for 60 cents. Maybe I'll pick that up. Maybe I'll build a deck with that someday, right? Or, you know, going through here, it makes... Um, Oil, right? The uh, the the funny funny Murica meme one, I, oh, dude. I lost. I lost out. I got my Phantom Z Bell for I think sixty a piece. God damn it! I lost out like ten dollars. But even then, even then, even if I had waited, right? It makes it so that way I can get Infernoids cheaper, which I did get Infernoids cheaper. It makes sure if I need backup Blazing Cartesias, right? I have backup Blazing Cartesias for cheap. Phantom Eu Bell is now ten dollars under Nightmare Throne though, dude. That went up. I bought my Nightmare Thrones when they were twenty five a pop. Good God, though. Oh. <laughs> but, like, I'm, I'm fine if we want to have, like, these super rarity collections. I'm not a huge fan of locking an integral engine that a format is going to be entirely played around at the secret rare slot. I think we run into a cost prohibitive... Like, it's cost prohibitive format at that point. And, yes, chase cards should be expensive. That's like, well, well, Kip, you're saying that Black Lotus shouldn't be expensive. Oh, except that's a bad example because that's reserve list. That's like saying the new Shocklands and Magic shouldn't be expensive. I get it. It's going to be a high rarity. People are going to want to play it. Supply versus demand, they're going to be more expensive, right? Yeah, maybe they're going to be $30 a play set, up to $90, depending on what you're going, what, uh, what, what set releases, right? Like, I understand that. I'm not, not against that. Do you play Yu-Gi-Oh! at a competitive tier, though? There's no sort of reimbursement or anything. You still got to spend travel cost. There's no monetary incentive. There's no easy incentive to ease you out of that, right? Like, I, I got into the game and uh, back into the game in Necroz for a while. People were trading binders with, like, Treeborn Frogs and stuff to get Necroz. And I know Habit of Konami, eventually the, uh, the Fiendsmith engine is just going to die. It's going to get banned or limited in some capacity, or it's going to become irrelevant by the next thing that comes along. You know, I've seen this all throughout my time playing. And so... I'm kind of not sold on it as much as I want to play you, Bell. And even then, maybe I'm okay taking the L's. I don't have to win every game I come into, especially coming back and learning this game. And I like that we have personalities like Farfa that are going, you know, this is pretty cross. This is pretty cross. Wow, I can English. This is pretty cost prohibitive, right? And I think calling that out is a good step. Dragon Master Magia, I don't care if it's $500. Eventually, they'll release a reprint down the line because Konami is a, a pretty aggressive reprint policy. And I'll be able to get a lesser rarity version at some point in the future, right? Generally how that works, right? Totally cool with that. I don't need it. It's a, it's a, it's a want, not a need. Something like Fiendsmith, which is an entire format is being based around, starts to go into that need category if you're playing competitively, and that becomes a problem because you don't have enough supply, so the demand skyrockets, and thus you're spending way too much for cardboard. Seeing a lot of complaining about rarities and info, which is understandable to a large extent, but when you also saw the same people complaining about how bad value-wise sets have been like Phantom Nightmare Legacy of Destruction, it's a bit crazy. Infinite Forbidden is the first core set since Age of Overlord worth Fair. buying. Ha, <laughs> okay, Vendor. <laughs> There's some interesting things to unpack here, which is a video topic in and of itself, but I'll try to give the most briefest rundown and explanation of why this is a problem. And I promise okay. you that I'm it ready. isn't as simple as make card lower rarity. So right. if all the good cards in a deck are cheap, that's great for 
for us because now we can afford to buy decks for like 100 to 200 dollars max right. which in the context of other card games is reasonable because yes. right now as it stands you are paying about 900 total for a snake eye fiendsmith deck main right. and extra now if all the cards are easy and cheap to pull that's going to be bad for vendors which i mean who cares about the Yu-Gi-Oh landlord well the difference between <laughs> landlords yeah. and vendors is that it means that local game stores won't be able to support Yu-Gi-Oh. nobody needs to buy the product so the box is crash in price so now the store is in debt to spending on product that no one wants to buy you do this i can see that no, no i have two local stores two out of the local stores that i've played with over the years that will still do Yu Gi Oh. it is wild to me like a lot of places have pulled out of stock new i went to target the other day they don't have Yu Gi Oh anymore at least where i'm at they don't have Yu Gi Oh. they have a bunch of pokemon they got disney lorcana there's no Yu Gi Oh though it's wild dude for enough sets and local stores bleed money on Yu-Gi-Oh and then they decide well we don't want to sell Yu-Gi-Oh anymore because it's just a massive loss Cost that is the gist of why it's bad for the economy of the yeah, game no I'm sense. not trying to justify this I'm just explaining the objective truth and reality of what happens when every card is cheap this is a fundamental cart before the horse how many back in the day how many hidden arsenal sets did you see just sitting there hidden arsenal boxes how many boxes of um, the, 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 the armed thunder dragons, the armed dragon thunder, whatever they were, right? How many sets did you see there? How many bad sets have you just seen there? Just sitting on the shelf, right? I've seen it all th ever since I've been playing this game on and off, right? I've seen it. I understand. I totally get what he's saying. And it makes sense, right? And that's why you have things like what the set that Pot of, uh, Pot of Prosperity came out in, you know, that was kind of the reason to buy that set unless you have a lot of bulk from that set. Like... When you when a shop stocks something, it costs money to keep it there. So let's think about this from a objectively financial standpoint, right? If I were to say buy Funny Pickle Rick game, right, like little little tabletop like Uno game or whatever in a Pickle Rick skin, and it doesn't sell, man, I could have had Pokemon or Magic the Gathering in that exact spot. I bought it. I still haven't turned it around. I haven't made profit off of it. I might have to put it on sale just to get rid of it. Or like, say you're running a shop, right? Say you're running a storefront and you buy a crap ton of wheat bread, but nobody buys, nobody buys wheat bread. People buy everything but that wheat bread and then it spoils. You've lost that entire investment. You have profited nothing off of that. And it costed money to keep that wheat bread there, right? It, 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 it just sat there, it, it molded, it got bad, and now you've lost it, right? It costs money to keep things on the shelf. And if it's not selling, you could have used it for literally anything else to potentially make money. I'm not opposed to people making money. I'm really not. I get it. It's a business at the end of the day. V vendors get into a weird area. I've met some really weird vendors. ...type of problem because the issue isn't change the rarities of the cards. It's a product thing that needs to maybe be completely re-envisioned. Both sides of the discussion here are correct in some way. If mm -hmm. cards are cheap, boxes become worthless. If boxes right. become worthless, then stores shut down. If yeah. stores shut down, there's no game to play. It's a really bad cycle that needs to be addressed. There's an incredibly good video on this topic by Kodok that was released three years ago that I'll leave a link to in the description. But basically, it breaks down mathematically why you go booster box have specifically a really egregious problem in this regard more than any other card game and how to fix this. Topic mm. number four, Maxi. I should have made this the third topic. Max <laughs> three. Max three. Got him. First, there was La Cucaracha. Cute. Been around for 14 years and still dominating the Master Duo and OCG metagame. And then there was Perulia pre-selling at 50 a pop, by the way, still. Wow. And now a third Maxi has hit the format. This one being significantly stronger than the previous two in basically every way. Wow. I think only Flunder is the deck that gets hurt by Perulia more than this one. Because this Malcharmy card allows you to draw a card for every single special summon your opponent conducts from the main deck or the extra deck. Of course, ooh, as you belt player i'm gonna have to watch out for that it does have that multi restriction which is you can't activate it if you control cards so basically you can't do your full combo and drop this which is fundamentally one of the worst aspects of maxi and absolutely the most frustrating egregious moments of Yu-Gi-Oh when is you have to go second into a field and crack their board and deal yeah. with the maxi so this eliminates that part of the issue the problem is that this multi army card and why a lot of people are upset about this is because of the fact that it is really strong no this is actually 
actually a new maxi no yeah. please this card without a doubt is going to be a hundred percent a staple in every single side deck you could even main this and if you go first and you draw it well i don't know use it as a discard or something because uh -huh. like that's how powerful this is it it could be worth main decking because you will lose half your dice rolls statistically that's and wild. it will get a lot of value depending on which deck you're playing against and so that's a problem for the next set so uh you know we're dealing with one piece of drama at the time but that has been one of the major things that has set social media on fire is this card i guess what i have to ask and what i have to think about right is you think ahead what is the end game here right like what what is konami's goal for this because i've absolutely said things right uh destiny 2 right why are they writing the witness in such a way and you know even during lightfall before final shape came out right it's like well i mean to destroy the witness we've already showcased that the witness has too much power the only way you're going to really have to do it is you know you're going to have to sow some discord inside of him and have the uh the the parts of the witness because he's a collective right parts of the witness rebel against him to weaken him what happened in what happened in final shape effectively that right I've called so many things in Final Fantasy. It's trying to figure out where are they going with this. It sounds like, so we have Maxi, which is Earth. We got the water one, right? Now we have a wind one. Are they going to be doing a Maxi style thing for every element? Are they potentially at that point? It, there it is, the funny topic. Are they going to be unbanning Maxi? Maxi is an incredibly controversial card. Not in a way like, you know, Dark Magician having, you know, artwork uh, that got censored is, you know, kind of controversial, right? No, controversial in the sense that the game warps around Maxi, and I've had a lot of discussions in regards to why Maxi warps the game. The OCG is interesting because it it functions around Maxi being played. If if you even if you don't play Maxi, you have to play the game understanding your opponent could be playing Maxi. And you know, there's people that are way more qualified to speak on if it should or shouldn't be banned. It almost seems like we're going into a very powerful hand trap archetype right the the max c's if you will and i i don't know what their end goal is going to be do they just ban all of them do they limit all of them or do we have some kind of weird system where we have kind of like the ocg has max c at three and then the tcg has max c at zero i don't know like i want to know where this ends like they have their pipeline like we have the next set coming out right like, the, like we were seeing the next set coming out ban list is going to be after um after the event right what in the following sets is this going to make sense or is this a you know a moment where wow we've konami's just printed some really powerful stuff yeah we kind of need to back off from this game which has happened in the past right how many players quit during teledad how many players quit during dragon ruler format how many players quit during tier shizu format how many players quit during uh when pendulums got released and pendulums were under what was it master rule three yeah, because it was three, four was original links, right? And we should be under five now, which restores extra deck to any zone and link only to the link zone when they start, right? Something like that. Can't remember. But no, old pendulums were, that, that, like someone said earlier, that is kind of a breaking point for a lot of people. Those are the main sort of topics here. Just to touch upon, lastly, there has been the closing down of Speed Duel. Yes, they are shutting Aww. down Speed Duel for a rest. I don't know if this is temporary or permanent, or maybe we're getting Rush Duel coming to uh, the West, I suppose. I was going to say TCG, but it's technically not TCG. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but I, one thing that I thought was really funny was the uh, latest Speed Duel set. Uh, it contains Maxi, which is great <laughs> for Time Wizard formats in the TCG. It means we get some kind of reprint here, because Maxi is a really expensive card, yeah, despite it, it being banned here is very popular in retro formats. Yeah, it is. Last final thing is the quarter century Bazinga. Yeah, so we're, we're getting Rarity Collection 3, basically. The caveat being is that there is a slot in each booster pack dedicated to a side set on a pool of 200 other cards. Okay. Each pack contains one card from that other set. So they've described it as a set within a set, and hopefully that'll have, like, randomly really useful and good reprints. Specifically, time was a lot of people have been waiting for things like Dust Shoot, for example, to get reprinted. And you saw in Rarity Collection a bunch of, like, Time Wizard-related cards cards like Raikou, like Nimble Hamster have been reprinted because those are right. old cards that just haven't seen any reprints in years. I, right. I guess that's Nimble good. Uh, I don't know about you, but maybe some people are feeling fatigue from Rarity Collection because the second one definitely wasn't as hype as the first one. But I mean, listen, reprints are always good. So as long yeah. as the cards are good, I don't think anyone can complain. Not really.
But whew, what a week, man. Oh my god. Uh, personal thoughts and stuff. I don't know. I just I, I'm exhausted. Like I'm just, I'm tired. I feel I feel tired. Like that it was just one bang, bang, bang announcement after the other. It was uh here's a quarter century product, here's a new Mac C. Uh, here's a ban list. Oh wait, actually there is no ban list. What am I thinking about the format personally? Uh mm -hmm. I think it'll be fine to watch once. Playing it might be very Degenerate. frustrating, Degenerate. but regardless, it, it's cool to see new cards in action. And and I I, I guess that's really the, my, my only positive takeaway is that it's one of those observer things. You ever watch like stun play against each other in a mirror match and it's just like the worst duel yeah. ever, but it's like really funny. But it's if you were to put yourself fight. in that position and play it yourself, it, it, it sounds like it would be like a nightmare. That's kind of like how I view this upcoming TCG WCQ season. I don't have to partake in it. And at a base level, it's it's cool to see how broken Yu-Gi-Oh can get. And I, I think this will probably be one of the most broken formats we've ever seen. So uh, show us what you can do. Thank you so much everyone for watching. At until next time, make sure you Patreon, subscribe, for more and follow me on Twitch specifically streaming from 2 p.m. UK most days. Bye bye. Love it. That was a good video. I liked it. It was a good commentary. Fish now? Why the fish? Why is there always fish? I can't escape the fish. If you have not watched Farfa before, oh boy, I hope you just found some uh, some new awesome person that you get to watch down in the description down below. I will link their channel as well as this video. Definitely recommend you check him out. As I said, I heard a lot of positive things about him. And you can see he's very logical. Um, he's very level-headed. Just awesome personality to watch. And yeah, as always, when I react to somebody new, if they're not okay with it, if they're not okay, you know, say, hey, you know, you're using the video. You weren't transformative enough. You know, I'm always open to people messaging me saying, hey, you know, kind of need you to take this down. You know, I, it is my content. I don't really like reactions to it. And that's perfectly fine. I'm more than happy to, if that is the case, to also spread the word as well. Um, but honestly, you know, looking some of these Yugi, uh, back at some of these Yugi tubers, Farfa, excellent personality, uh, especially coming back into the game after so long. You know, just one of those things that trying to absorb as much information as I can. And I probably came back at a really weird time now that I'm looking at it. But I got you, Bell. I got you, Bell. Um, been waiting on that for years and years. You know decade plus and i'm kind of happy with that so we'll see where that goes thank you everyone for watching definitely appreciate it go check out farfa see you in the next one